in this episode, we are going to be reviewing A New Leaf, which was released in 1971. This was directed by Elaine May. She also wrote the screenplay. It was adapted from the short story called The Green Heart by Jack Ritchie, and it starred Walter Matthau and Elaine May. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, and theater, amongst other things. I want to welcome back to the show, Adam Shardoff. He has worked in the music industry for many years before turning his attention to film. In 2007, in 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 2011, he founded Film Wax, a media company devoted to the championing of independent films. Film Wax Radio began a short time later, but has since grown into a familiar and popular part of the indie film landscape. Since its start, there have been over 700 episodes with over 1,200 guests. Adam, welcome back. Thanks for joining me again. It's my three-peat. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, By the way, back in the music business, in the sorry, what, what, was that? I'm a back sentence? in the. I'm actually oh, back, back in, in the music. music. We have to update sorry. your bio because my bio for oh, you. Oh, this is an older. <laughs> well, I probably it's you know I this Latin this starting this year. I, I'm working at a radio station, and so I'm I, it's a music station. So I'm back. You know, you've interviewed everybody. Uh, I mean, just if anyone hasn't checked out Adam's great show, you can you can watch many of them either on YouTube or or his website, but uh, I mean, some, you know, Paul Schrader and some Lee Grant, some, you know, major, major, you know, legend. Herzog. Herzog, uh, you know, (laughs) some of the big, 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 big guns. Was was anyone, um, anyone related to this film ever on your show? Oh, that's a great question. Which is what's the film? We have Walter Matthau. You know, I mean, Elaine May doesn't do interviews, so I know that's a no. And it's just, Uh, I believe me, I well, you know that I have a connection. Doris Roberts, but yeah, no, no. Although I met, I kind of met Doris Roberts many years ago. She was a friend of my aunt's, and um, she came to her, and I went my uncle's funeral. She came to it. Um, So there was this, yeah, and then we had a thing back at the house. I'm sure she was there. Uh, my, at, at their house in L, in uh, the Hollywood Hills. Uh, this is, uh, I had an uncle, my, it's uh, technically it was my father's uncle who was a, uh, an agent to the stars, you know, um, and he handled quite a, a number of interesting clients. And one of his clients was probably Doris Roberts, I'm guessing, or she was just friends with my aunt who was a casting agent at ABC. So it's possible. Maybe she cast her on, on Remington Steel, for instance. I, was that an, I don't know. Was that an ABC show? I can't remember. But anyway, I, I, I getting off track. So no, I don't think anybody in this film, it goes back too far, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Elaine May is still alive. But, uh, Elaine is. May is still alive, but she's probably the only one in the cast who is. Yeah, well, because, you know, Matthau died in 2000, I believe. Jack Weston died in the 90s. Uh, Renee James Taylor. Coco. Yeah, uh, is is still with us though? Is she uh, with us? Yes, yes, yeah, she's great. She's oh, hilarious. Right. Uh, people will know her if that name, name doesn't ring a bell. People will know her mostly from the nanny, right? But, where she, uh, played, she also uh, Nan, Fran Drescher's mom and that. That's right. That's right. And uh, she also was a great writer uh, with her husband, and they made a film that which is also a play but they wrote loves lovers and other strangers oh wonderful thing yeah that's so good and a film that her and both her husband did i I don't know have you ever seen made for each other 1970 same year 1971 really good oh i'm not sure i have yeah it's 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 one of these films that hopefully a blu-ray boutique company will uh right you know restore one day uh joseph bologna on her it's really yeah. now, good. I did have a little interaction with Joseph Bologna because at one point I'm trying to remember with what company it was where I was working, but I was emailing with him. I actually have emails with Joseph Bologna. This would oh, have wow. been a few a few years before he not long before he died. 
couple of years. I'm trying okay. to remember the circumstances. It's not worth trying. To, but I do. I have emails with Joseph Bologna. Oh. And I was going to also try to get him on Film Wax. Why not? You know. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been great. Yeah. He's, uh, he, yeah, he's also uh, passed. So, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of this cast is uh, no longer with us, unfortunately. But um, I, I, this is, you know, I'm such a major Elaine May fan. Uh, you know, Heartbreak Kid and Mikey and Mickey are, are certainly in my top five. Uh, this one and, and Ishtar, I mean, I think Ishtar is top like five what? Right top five films <laughs> are you serious oh yeah I mean, they're wonderful films wait are you saying that that you're that big of an elaine may fan huge huge oh okay like, all right so those, those two i mean you know she made four films but but two of them i mean that this one is really really good even though it's got some some problems which i'm sure we'll get into and ishtar for me that's got a perfect first half second half uh not so good even though i know that's become like a cult favorite over the years, but, but heartbreak kid and, and Mikey and Nikki to me are, are, are two of the all time great American works that are totally underrated in, in my right. view. Have you seen those? I'm sure you've seen them. Oh my God. Yeah. I, yeah. and, um, I, I just showed, um, to my, my girlfriend who's grew up in Denmark, um, which is what you do when you're Danish apparently. So she, but she has lived here for a long time, but she's never seen, she never saw a new leaf. And she's oh. never seen the heartbreak kid. So okay. I was, and then I also showed her, this is off topic a little bit, but I, I also showed her a diary, of a diary of a mad housewife. Oh yeah. That's uh, great. Cause my, it was, the theme was obnoxious American men, you know, like, like the, <laughs> those three characters, Walter Matthau is probably the, <laughs> I mean, his character Henry in this movie is probably the most likable of the three <laughs> I, mean, I would say so although yeah. he is a, he he is he is plotting to kill her so i don't know maybe i'm wrong yeah yeah well she um she apparently i didn't know this she apparently wanted not to take anything away from math out but she apparently wanted christopher Plummer, and and i could see him being better for it because he has more of that upper class pompousness yes. where you know right. like Whereas Matthau, I mean, he's always great, but he's he's very he's very urban. He's very New York. Yeah, so yeah he's like an Oscar Madison more than he is exactly. a Henry uh, Henry uh, Graham. But, yeah. but although I will say this, it's an interesting point you're making. However, I will say I kind of like this overly uh, an uh, what's the word overly kind of uh, acted, you know, a, a comical you know, version of a, of an, like an upper elite uh, clown in a way, or a snob, you know, like, like it's so, whereas with Christopher Plummer, it's true. I don't, Walter Matthau, I don't know he's so, he's so funny in that, in doing that he where really I don't is. know Christopher Plummer would have been as funny. I'm not sure. It's hard to say. I mean, on film, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on his filmography, but I, I, can't recall seeing him be really funny but i did see him in a uh, one man show he did for years here in toronto called barrymore oh. where he played john barrymore and it's it's actually very it was very com comedic he had great timing so i i it would have been interesting uh yeah. but again you know no regrets no regrets because you know right. Matthau uh i thought was really wonderful do you remember when you first saw this does it pop out into you does it stick in your well, mind i yeah i mean it was probably in the last i mean this movie i came to quite late i don't know why um i think i i think i always assumed i had seen it right and then finally i just you know rent i don't remember how i saw it but i put it on this has got to be i'm gonna guess in the last five or six years possibly even as recent as that okay and okay. then you know and i wrote i've never sat through this film how is it possible? And I fell in love with it. Um, just thought it was, it, there are flaws in it, but yeah. you get, you forgive them almost immediately because there's just like, you know, so many incredible moments oh, in this God, movie. Yeah. And just Elaine May's performance in this is just so per, almost perfect. You know, her, she's perfect. Um, she's so funny. It's, uh, it's, it's just great. Yeah. yeah. No, I so agree. I saw it. And then since then, I've seen it like several times, you know, number I've seen it four or five times. 
yeah, I thought she was uh, really wonderful. And what I what I like so much about what she did with that part is, I, I think I think it would have been easy to have made her like the the ditzy rich girl, you know, and over the top and and in love with money. But she take she kind of spins that sort of cliche part, and and this woman who's so so rich because of her family, but is actually not interested in in money at all. Uh, you know, like she's she's so into her career and 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 bot bo- I always get that word wrong. It's bottomy. Yeah. yeah. Um, she's so passionate about plants. <laughs> and and I think that's why she's so easily taken advantage of and naive. And um, it, you know, of course you find out this is when we meet Doris Roberts that the, the people who take care of her house are stealing from her and these things just go over her head. I mean, she's so, which, you know, I, I imagine you're not, you're not meant to take it so, so seriously because I can't help sometimes to, to look at things a little more realistically and think, well, why would this woman who's so intelligent be so, so, so ignorant about so, something like that? I mean, how could she not know these people are like stealing from her, how could she not know that right. Matt Dow well, was your clearly... version? Your your version would have been a dramatic film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. This is all about, you know, you have to accept. Yeah, exactly. Right, like yeah, you um, got to accept the absurdity of it and, right. and the sort of satirical nature of. So and of course it works. I mean, I mean, she's she's almost you know she's almost teasing you with it. Like even even at certain times when he's really charming her like the scene where the her lawyer finds out that he actually is conning her and (laughs) he comes up with this story uh that he was going to commit suicide and all this stuff and she she believes it and then these like these music comes in and it's so like tweety birds and and it's like she you know she's not telling you to take that seriously it's meant to just be ridiculous and and you just take it for for face value but i i accept it all i'm not like oh this is this is ridiculous. I, I'm just totally, I just go with it. You know, I, I don't know if, I'm sure you do as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I love it. It's one of my favorite comedies of all time as well. Um, I put this in the pantheon of, maybe this is something you say towards the end of our episode here, but like, you know, it came in out in 1971, but I mean, I, I think that period of time, like you produced so many great American comedies. Oh yeah, you know. So in the late '60s, early '70s, there were just so many. So this is at the top. Is this is the Heartbreak Kid that you mentioned? Um, you know, and um, uh, I also love uh, I love the Odd Couple movie. I think that's mm. a cla- you know classic. And yeah, and I mentioned I mentioned uh, Diary of a Mad Housewife, which people can see a little. It's a little easier to see that movie. It was very difficult to see that one for a long time but i think it's come back into circulation yeah i actually just That's... saw that before new year's because it was on uh, criterion channel for a while i believe right. took it down and i and yeah I, that was another film i thought how have i not seen this i had heard about it because i like uh the director a lot per- uh oh god his name escapes me now last name's perry i believe uh, oh yeah I don't know if you know off the top of your head he also did um the swimmer Right. Berlin. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of great films. Um, It'll come to me in a moment too. Yeah. But what was so, what was so interesting about the way she writes men and you see this in a heartbreak kid and Frank you know, Perry, Frank Perry, that's it. Frank Perry. Thank you. Um, is she, you, you don't really see, you know, you see sort of, you know, quote unquote, what, what we would say now, like, you know, to- toxic uh, masculinity or toxic men. But she she writes it from, you know, like from a place of, of humor, but at the same time showing that, you know, that he's he's ridiculous, that he's he's so silly and, and pompous and, and stupid like she's happy. But I, you don't feel that she's totally making fun of him. You always feel that she <laughs> you sort of feel as though she's behind them in a certain way or that she loves these all these people in a, in a certain way. Because Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, I balance. think. Well, here's, here's, okay, well, let's first set it up a little also. This is her first film. Yeah. 
you know, no doubt based, I mean, I would think she was par- somewhat inspired by the success of her former comedy partner, Mike Nichols, who was having tremendous success uh, with, um, he directed, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And then he directed uh, The Graduate. Yeah. Also in the top few comedies of all time, I think. You Absolutely. Know, I just showed it, should have showed it to my son for the first time who loved it. Oh, and, not great. Yeah. And, um, you know, th- these guys, the two of them were this huge, I mean, they were a phenomenon. They were like, there was like the Beatles and Nichols and May. They were a huge thing. Um, their comedy was considered pretty groundbreaking for at the time. And they, it lasted as long as the Beatles did. I mean, just they kind of broke up pretty quick, you know, because they both had so much uh, to, to they wanted to do. And I'm sure Elaine May was had a harder time of it, I'm guessing, because she was a woman. Hmm. And uh, but when they did split, you know, Mike Nichols immediately hit the ground running and had huge success on screen and stage. He actually also directed the original stage uh, version of the uh, the odd couple on stage and then didn't end up doing the film version. But Elaine May then decided, I'm sure somewhat inspired by his success. I'm guessing again with with those two Virginia Woolf and um, graduate were such huge successes. Um, I mean, I don't know immediately, but I, I believe they were. Um, and um, and then probably decided to break out on her own with a new leaf. You know, this was based on a yeah. short story that she probably came across by this author, Jack Ritchie. Did you, is this in your notes too? Yeah, I have it on IMDb. I didn't read the short story, but I-, I No, did. I, <laughs> no I, yeah. I don't write, <laughs> I don't think. I, I mean, he, this author, apparently, I mean, he only wrote one full-length novel. So this, he was a real short story writer. Okay. Mostly of do- detective novels or murder mysteries, that kind of thing. So right. it's interesting you wrote this. I don't know if it was written as a comedy or if she adapted it into a comedy. Hard to say because uh, I'm sure you read that there was this whole subplot where right. which, was, which yeah. was eliminated, where he like murdered, <laughs> killed a couple By who? Of guys. By who? Uh, sorry, you mean the script? The the script who, who, who took it out of her hands and butchered? Oh, and Evans. I'm, right, uh, Robert, Robert Evans. Evans had a Paramount. That's right. Uh, who you know people he was very well known public publicly and even you know now because of his books you know the kid stays in the picture um and it, you know it's hard to believe that this is a film that is an hour fifth uh it's like an hour and 50 minutes or actually even less than that it's uh or an hour 40 an hour 45 and it was a three hour film and he cut out like that's like almost half the movie like right and, but he, he did it, a good I, you know portion right. of it and it's never the director's cut never come out uh, no. came out I, I i have to say it was a good choice yeah he now, may have been right yeah <laughs> i think know, he was right i think producers usually never right when it comes to well robert editing, evans but... say, say what you will i mean you know was brilliant he was yeah i he mean did, from what i can tell a lot and... he did add a lot to the films he produced he wasn't just a money guy like you know, like yeah. even with Coppola, I think Coppola turned in Godfather and it was like two hours or less. And he was like, no, nah, you got an opera in there. This is this is a three hour film. And Coppola was like a, a producer telling me to make my film longer. And sure enough, now it's a classic. What? Well, it's always been a classic. Yeah. But yeah, he was he very was a pretty creative guy. He wasn't just here's your cash and go with it, you know. Um. So, yeah, but. Yes, that's right. So um, I'm I'm glad they there was a subplot where Walter Matthau's character, who you know we we laugh at, and who sort of uh, you know inherited his wealth, right? Yeah, has no real <laughs> direction. I mean, he's a man who's supposed to be, I guess, in his middle age. Yeah, um, and has never wanted to be in a serious relationship, and you know. Because he's a ch- man child. I mean, he's, yeah. you know, he's a and, fun, but he's had no career. <laughs> he's just lived off of his inheritance. Yeah. Until it runs out. So, right. So, um, anyway, I, I, you know, still think, I think Walter Matthau was perfect casting, but I'm glad they got rid of that subplot where he supposedly murders 
yeah. her, uh, uh, his Elaine May's character, Henrietta's lawyer and some other, right? Yeah. Um, there's a plot where he poisons them and they actually, you know, he kills them successfully. That would have really have changed it into a much even darker film. And also, I don't know, I think the simplicity of the story of his awakening his humanity it finally had and his finally having a purpose she brings him purpose and it's um yeah it's a beautiful it's a beautiful um process to watch yeah i agree i agree you and know that's something that grows on you with multiple viewings first you watch mm -hmm. it right like you like listening to a song you first listen for the hook and the music but then you start listening to the lyrics and you start to understand you know here also it's a it's actually there's it is a um i think a very rich and nuanced story uh, or movie and this this and henry's humanity uh that part of the story watching that part of the performance is is a really wonderful aspect to it once you get beyond all the funny bits that and there's yeah. so many many of them so many character actors from the 70s in this movie anybody loves character actors from that period is gonna love they haven't seen this movie you're gonna just love that yeah <laughs> yeah it's got the, the 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 supporting cast is is fantastic we as well um but one you know i i don't know how you felt about the way it ended but i I'm really curious. I mean, I agree with you that I, in, I mean, again, it's hard to say what exactly that was going to look, look like if it sure. was our version. Uh, I, it would have been hard to have kept up with the comedy if it was going to turn to murder. Um, but well, it's been done bef before. It's, it's, diff true. it's probably a challenge, it's hard, but, but it, it does happen. Yeah. People have done it quite well in the past. Other, you know, there are some great comedies that where murders have taken place by the main character, you know, yeah yeah it's it's it, it could be it could be hard to pull off but um what what was interesting about the end of course you know we we you know he what happens for anyone who, who hasn't seen it is as adam was saying he, he he has he's a trust fund you know guy and he's living off his inheritance and he spends way he spends all of his money and his lawyer says this is like you know accountant at the beginnings like you you got you got nothing left and so he he takes a loan from his uncle and his uncle hates him <laughs> played by james coco <laughs> yeah he was great and um the, but this the, the contract was that he had to repay it in six weeks or else he was gonna you know owe tons of interest on top of it so his plan was to marry someone with wealth and and that way he he would have his wealth back and then he'd be able to pay you know his money you know pay his uncle back because it was interesting was that he he lives then, in this um you know a high-end fashion he's going to the tennis clubs and he's going to these high-end restaurants i love when he goes to say goodbye to all those places i was dying when he, right, had, he when was he, like right after the meeting with his lawyer and he realized he has a, he's penniless he's penniless he does a you know a walk around the city new york city at all the play lutess and all these uh play you know at the polo the polo club and this it's like that. he was and dying you know it was like it was like saying it's like i'm dying I, i'm goodbye everyone i just thought right um yeah. i thought that was that was but really really funny you left out of his plan though which was of course to write to marry rich right so he could pay and then pay yeah. back but then what would he do with his wife exactly Once exactly he, so so, gonna, so his plan was her. he was gonna he was gonna take her out and, and 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 he also couldn't stand her, which was which was another thing that was in was interesting. Was I, I think he was expecting her to be like the you know the 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 cliche you know rich rich types, and and she's the total opposite. She's nervous. She drops teacups easily. Well, she's, she's a clumsy. <laughs> she's clumsy. and she's you clumsy know. and yeah, she's socially inept, but. I yeah. you you know but you remember he did like you mentioned Renee Taylor he she was there is this uh scenes the yes. or a montage where he's hilarious. trying to find he has only a matter of days before his jig is up yeah and so he has to find this wife like within days and marry her 
<laughs> this one, the, the the ideal woman. I love that he thinks, and he, he does. He, he tries a number of different women. So um, one is Renee Taylor, and you know, uh, and her bosoms, and then um, um, he finally meets Elaine. No, so you say like he can't stand her, but I kind of feel like he. I do feel feel it's me interpreting, but there he does have some level a very, very re re like a repressed attraction to her on some level that she's the ideal one. And, you know, she just fits all the, you know, perfectly into makes all the, you know, necessary, uh, you know, uh, targets that he has to make in order to, uh, you know, marry her and get the money and then do away with her. But he, I think there's an element even from the start where he, he might be somewhat, a little attractive. Well, I, I think the I think the fact that she had this passion for what she did, and originally he's learning all about right, you know, uh, uh, plans in order to have something to talk about with her. But and then she finds out later that he had a history degree. So you know, right. I I think you don't know exactly uh, how he felt about that. But I think she she you know appealed to this uh, uh, perhaps more intellectual side of himself, you know, because he was really able to carry on these conversations about plants, right? I mean, that's not easy, even if you read up on it. <laughs> well, yeah, like he, did he a was a lot of know, reading about, well, he was trying to find a poisonous, you know, a way yeah. to, yeah, poisonous uh, method to do, you know, again, to get do away with her. But he, um, yeah, no, because during just, she opens him up and starts to, center him you know like to help her realize because he he's been ignoring this part of himself as long as he could like you know yeah. living a fast life until he ran out of money and yeah. then he could no longer ignore the fact that he has no career he has nothing you know it's like he can't ignore these things anymore you know i wanted to also mention his uh, manservant oh so good Who's so good in this? Is Harold some is great is gags. There. Butler, he is so funny in this movie. Yeah. Um, Harold, played by the great British actor George Rose. Now, I will say, I think he's British, but I, I could be wrong. But he, I did see George Rose in um, the original stage production of Pirates of Penzance. Well, original stage production. That's silly. The the like nineteen, I think eighties. It was the 80s or late 70s. I can't remember. But I was saw it with Linda Ronstadt, I believe, was in it. And um, anyway, um, he was the original, you know, major general. So I saw him on Broadway when I was oh, very wow. young. Yeah. Wow. No, he was he was hilarious. Yeah, you're right. He is British. I just I just checked. But the um the timing, the like particularly when the uh when the lawyer finds out that this whole thing is a con and he's in the other room just dropping things and listening right. and he's <laughs> and 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 i love how straight laced he was like mathal's panicking about what to do after it runs out of money and he's just so direct like well you know you this is what you're gonna have to do you're gonna have to you're gonna have to yeah. well, marry he, goes, a woman. <laughs> he says first he goes so well martha comes back and says, what would you uh, he said well, you know, what would you do if I, if I, if I was penniless? He goes, well, so I'd leave immediately, I suppose. <laughs> and then later he goes, and then he, yes, he says, uh, what was the other part you just mentioned? Uh, the, uh, uh, he, he was the one who told him you have to go, you have to, well, sir. You're gonna oh yeah. He goes, sir, he has, you have no other, you have no other, um, options. sir. And he goes, suicide, no, sir, marriage <laughs> to a woman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, by the way, I should tell just so your audience knows I have COVID. So I only mention it because it's a, if it does affect your memory, you know, you have just this kind of clouded thinking. And so, so yeah. And, and if I you see me struggling anyways, I dragged him <laughs> if you anyways. see me struggling, <laughs> so I hope I don't give it to you via zoom. Yeah. If that, if it, maybe that will be possible one day you could get even the zoom calls are no longer allowed right. you gotta stay indoors uh no he or was you can, or you can do a an ad, like an add-on a vaccine on your plan <laughs> you know yeah vaccine phone plan or internet plan um yeah no i liked him a lot but i i was um this this element of 
was interesting, you know, because his whole purpose is his lifestyle and his, you know, obsession with uh, what he has. And he's, you know, so superficial. I mean, I love the way she opened it, which again was was actually visually quite clever, where it it looked as if we're doctors were on an operating table and he's there watching and you don't know anything about him. So you think, oh, he's very concerned for uh, his wife or his child or, you know, someone's dying. And then of course, when the, when the, <laughs> it's actually a mechanic who says everything's okay. And then the camera pulls back and then you're like, oh no, he's in a, he's in a, a garage and he's so, you know, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to take care of your car, but he's treating this car like, like, like a, like a loved one. And, and that's just, it was, I thought that was fascinating how she, she was sort of setting you up. To, to think the story was about one thing, but it's like, oh no, wait a minute. This guy is, this is, this is some kind of a, some kind of a, you know, materialistic man. I mean, I, I thought that was brilliant, that opening. I don't know how you felt uh, about it. Oh no, it was. This is a very well, I mean, you know, even though it was taken out of her hands again by That's Robert right. Evans and Paramount, but they still, you can still manage to see there's a really well conceived and executed sophisticated filmmaking here yeah so, uh, p- film with with you know and um because there's just a lot of nuances in there that there's, there's a lot of thought went into all of the you know just dis- decisions that were made in the script and everything i mean it's just really all makes a lot of sense and there's nothing feels forced or rushed or accidental yeah it's a really good she's just a really gifted storyteller oh God, yeah. um yeah and so he wins her over in this like 48 hour period he managed to get her to marry him they go on their honeymoon he's trying to he's plotting how to get rid of her from the beginning and those scenes are just hysterical where he again i think this is where in these scenes where he's makes he, he you know it's just done for last but he makes slips like he almost says he's gonna kill her you know um he's reading you see him reading like um right poisons uh yeah. poisonous plant i mean <laughs> i forget what it is but yeah, like i know what you mean it just says yeah. like poison on the front or something yeah, it's, just, like... <laughs> it's like you know and it's for the camera to see and yeah he's, he's totally ignoring the room. her <laughs> yeah and um and i love the scene on their honeymoon also where they're unpacking and she and there's two beds in this hotel room or you know they're on um are they in the canary where where did they go like some tropical spot right yeah yeah so she could do some um searching for original plant species and um anyway so he's she goes you know which bed do you want oh and he goes either i'll take this bed you you have that bed and then we'll we'll use this bed when we you know sleep to, when we I forget how exactly how he puts it, but when we're yeah, when we're sharing it's like the bed. when we're together, where he says when something we're sharing the, the bed, of... we'll be in this your yeah. bed, yeah. <laughs> but you know, he's just so so funny. Well, the, well, I the mean... whole I, at first, you know, because he's like not interested in women at all. I mean, even in that this the 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 first scene where he well, before he meets Elaine May, okay, uh, uh, you know, there's you it's a POV shot of him like at a party and you only hear him talking to someone else. And, and the guy says, you didn't strike me as someone interested in, in women. And he goes, yeah, it was a surprise to me too. So he's asexual. I don't think he was gay. I think he just had no interest in, in, well, women. no, so, no, no think I think in re- case? well, in relationships. Yeah. Just, I oh, mean, okay. Just, so it was, there just was a I think, yeah, this is told by Elaine may, you know, she's probably has, uh, for that's probably her, sh- you know, insinuating some things about men, but, um, oh, I see. you know, it's also, a, you know, in terms of the way the women are, um, treated and all by men or the way that, you know, but, um, I don't, I didn't really took those scenes too seriously, but, but, um, you know, well, even uh, the way, but there's also a lot of misogyny in, in oh, films. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. in yeah. those days, um, you know, and just in general, so. It was pretty typical that women, you know, this was the uh, men, single men who never wanted to get married. It was a thing back then. I if you look at any say. Jerry Lewis movie or, you, you know, yeah. or th- there was just lots of comedies that coming out of the 50s in the, to the 60s where, you know, women were a marriage was a headache, you know, and women were just there to have children. But, you know, so and then that changed in the 70s, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason I thought she was going more for this 
you know, not that it's really a big part of the film, uh, the asexual angles, because even with Renee Taylor, like she's like undressing and he's like horrified. He like falls over. So I, I know thought, okay, it's like, you know, what is he? What's what's the problem? Yeah. I mean, you know, she was she was an attractive woman. So, you know, that that's why I thought, you know, is this really. But then again, I see what you're saying, because he's not there just for pleasure, for sex. He's there because he's trying to mm. find the person to marry. Right. So, well, she seemed to fit the. But see, that's partially partly also goes back to what I was saying before. I, you know, you, he was, he, when he saw there was an aspect right from the start, maybe that he was attracted to because we learn by the end, he falls in love. I mean, he, he, yeah. he would never, he wouldn't quite say it. It's just not part of his personality or his character, but he falls in love with her. That's the beautiful part. He goes out, you know, the, the yeah. last scene, of course, you know, is in the rapids and all. And he, you know, obviously it's perfect. She's, there's a perfect solution to all of his problems she was gone you know she was as good yeah. as dead as good as yeah. dead and he figured he it out saves her. he saves her because he's in love with her he realizes once he realized i mean we skipped over a pretty important aspect which is when she finds that species that's uh on yeah. her from the honeymoon yeah and she names it after after him um you you see the, the, the sophila end- graham graham yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and you know yeah i mean he was genuinely touched by that when she tells him uh you know and he's like oh you know you got your slice of immortality and and now he does uh because it's under his name but yeah you know I, I i could accept him changing and you know falling in love it just it just felt i don't know how you felt about this it felt a little random for me because you know she was about you know he she was drowning and he was like, okay, yeah, problem solved. And then he realized that he didn't have the token she gave him. And that was what he had said was going to be the conversation piece. Hey, hey look, uh, I got a species named after me. And he was like, where's my token? And he goes back in to get her. So I thought he was going back in just to get, cause he thought she had the token, you know, cause he was no, going on no, about no. where's my token. Yeah. Well, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm a li- I might be a little bit more of a romantic. I don't know. <laughs> cause I, I feel like, He needed to find his purpose in life, you know, mortality too, supposedly. I mean, that's what this, uh, the, the, well, this species being named after him gives him right a bit of immortality, which is nice, but he, he was looking for purpose in his life. You know, he was uh, living a, a very selfish self. A selfish lifestyle, and then he ran out of money, which was the best thing that could have happened to him because it gave him an all new, you know, a uh, uh, chance, you know, um, uh, at a real life with meaning. And she, between her and a career, because he he had a great, all right, I'll give the being a teacher a shot of being a professor, you yeah, know, because yeah, you know, this whole lifestyle that you know was everything he was resisting until he ran out of money. All of a sudden, it seemed quite appealing to him. It just took him. A, he would never quite admit it the way maybe you know. I see you, what you're saying. But yeah, so I feel like so the like him freaking out about the token was almost just like him trying to convince himself that he doesn't love her. Like, do you think that? Yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah, and when it yeah. was gone, he I realized, oh my god, I, 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 what have I, what am I doing here? That she means everything to me. I mean, I think it's a very what's beautiful about. Elaine May is she never says it like that. And the character never like, you know, nowadays, I hate to say it, but a lot of movies might make him, you know, like say it, say the words. Oh, exactly. what was I thinking? I exactly. love you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, you know, and, and save her, you know, they, I would be very interested to see somebody remake this movie just to see what choices, you know, obviously Ben Stiller for, you know, made a big mistake by trying to remake I haven't game. seen it, but I heard it's awful. And, yeah, there's no reason to see it. <laughs> it's really bad. But, um, but uh, you know, I don't think anybody needs to remake this movie. Um, but I'd be interested. But the reason I, I think it's so great is because you know he never says I. I don't think he, he never says I love you. He never. Yeah, he's no, remains no. true. You know he. It would he's take stub- a long. He's stubborn he, with his views. He kind of. might. Well, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're asking a, you know, a tiger to, uh, you know, what is it? A leopard and is it a leopard who has stripes? Tiger. 
Uh, I'm telling you, man, I am, I am oh, man. struggling. Those, and those, those metaphors, you, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. So he's not going to overnight become I see a what new you're person, saying. but he's, yeah. you see, he's at the beginning of a journey now that he finally embraced a uh, purpose yeah. and, and love and, you know, a meaning in his life. So he's ready. So the next chapter is him you know, enjoying that. And I'm sure yeah. he does fall in, and able to say, I love you at a certain point. Cause he, you can see his affection. There's that part. There's a scene um, before when she d- comes back so excited, she's yelling from, she's re- running into the front lawn at their mansion, you know? Yeah. And yeah. we're skipping over so many funny scenes, by the way, that take place in the movie. So people. Well, that's even, okay. We don't, we, yeah. yeah. We don't no, know. No. Oh, I know. I'm just saying for your audience that <laughs> yeah. there's so much wonderful scenes about oh, the whole process of them moving into the ha- built, uh, oh, mansion and the great. staff yeah. and the staff and the staff and the it's just hysterical actors. Fires everybody, you know. By the way, the peer is. I'm guessing this is the case, but the old lady that is like the very old the, the maid who remember he gets stuck behind her as she's going up the stairs. Yeah, yeah. Remember that? And then, wait, I, oh that, sorry, I'm thinking Doris. Oh yes, when he's going up, yeah, and he's like, yeah, he's there's just a lot of staff. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's waiting, and this woman's taking forever. She's too old to be working. <laughs> that I believe was Elaine May's mother-in-law. Oh, I could really? Be wrong. Oh, well, her last name uh, is Berlin. The woman's name is Berlin, that's, and yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Elaine May's first or one of her husbands was named uh, Berlin because of course, husband, yeah. their yeah. daughter is named Jeannie Berlin, who in her, herself is an amazing comic oh, actor and brilliant. famous actor who played Charles Grodin's wife in uh, the heartbreak. Kid. Uh, but in the scene where she's coming home with this, finally realizing that that plant species, she just took home from their honeymoon at is an original never before uh, identified species. So, yeah. She names it after, as we said, um, Asafala Grahami for him. And he, you can see how moved he is. Like at first he's he like, really was. Yeah. It's a beautiful scene. It's really yeah. lovely. Again, that was a know. really, that was a really great scene. I actually rewatched that again this morning. Cause I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to t- take a look at it. Cause I, I couldn't, I couldn't remember the details about the, the token. Cause as you said, at, at the end of the film, when he's freaking out about the token, uh, I just couldn't remember if they called that a necklace or what they called it. But yeah, when I watched it again, I was like, it's beautifully performed. Just uh, the way yeah. he reacts, like he's trying not to to show right. that he's touched. <laughs> right. And because well, first he thinks, yeah, she she's just sort of going to not take credit for the finding the fight because she's not naming it after herself or something. And then he thinks she's stupid. And then, you know, she says that she's named it after him. And you can see, yeah, it's just a really nice moment where he's moved. And I think it's a turning point, even though he still plots to, to try to kill her. <laughs> but I think it is a turning point which, yes, no, definitely. for him where, yeah. he's, he, he, where he's now realizing that, you know, he has real feelings for her. And um, that there's a whole, he's being, there's all this stuff coming into his life, which can be a little overwhelming, you know, for anybody yeah. that's so set in their ways. But maybe is ready for it too, you know, but it just takes a while. It took that last part of the movie. Yeah. You know, and then almost losing her till he, I, but that's the way, again, this is my interpretation from having seen it four or five times. I just ev- evolved into this way of thinking about. No, I, I, well, that's the beauty of a, you know, of a, of a movie like this. It's it, as you said, she doesn't write people who are necessarily going to say exactly how they feel or what they mean. Cause they, they may not necessarily know exactly how they feel uh so things are happening subconsciously so uh actually i i i I can totally see that because yeah i can certainly see he was changing that he was touched but then it was that token at the end but actually now that you put it that way that he just he wasn't he just couldn't quite admit to himself uh you know it's like he had to find a reason to go back in the water to get her like he couldn't admit that it was right you know that he genuinely right uh, yeah, love this woman. So I think that's interesting. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it that uh, that way. And um, one last thing I was going to mention was was he 
you know, he doesn't seem to think much of himself. Like in some ways he does. I mean, he thinks he can find a rich woman and marry her in a couple of days. I mean, you got to have a pretty big ego, <laughs> but at the same time, he doesn't think much about what he can do with his life. And it was the, his Butler who of course says to him, Hey, look, you know, look at you. Like, you know, you're, you've taken, you've, you've learned about botany. Yeah. You've, you've taken care of the household. You've you well, know, taken care of the taxes. Like he did have some, <laughs> he did well, have the some butler skills. identified right because the butler goes along with him into the new mansion and yeah. the new but he he well the butler again played by george rose who plays harold but he he's he knows he's he's the smartest person in the film you see oh and, absolutely and it's, it's conscious which is, of the piece yeah. which is like an old device going back in theater and but he see he sees the book poison book he sees the weapon you know he knows that that henry is plotting to kill henrietta he knows yeah. that yeah and he really likes henrietta and he sees he likes her he, because he sees that he's opening up henry into a real human being yeah. a mensch yeah. as we say in the jew business right that he <laughs> henry's become like he's becoming a real person and the and Harold, the butler, has a great affection for Henrietta and seeing what's happening. And he's scared that Henry might actually pull this off. Now, we didn't know that there's a subplot that was edited out. Maybe right, right. that we may, for, for all we know, because we've never seen that film, that maybe Harold saw him poison the, the lawyer and this other character. Uh, played by which was played by William Hickey, who does not appear in the film, but makes complete sense in the casting. You know, know what I'm talking about. I know that name is really. You know, him. you you just take a look. He's been. Yeah. In, uh, he was in Moon, Moonstruck, and um, number many many films. Anyway, um, so. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Well, he's in Mikey and Nikki. Yeah, I know who. He is. Oh right, that's right. That's yeah. right. Right. So he's some part of the the uh, Lane May stable of actors. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so that's what I think. Yeah. So he talks to uh, Walter Matthau's character, Henry, that uh, the butler talks to him and saying, you know, look at what you've achieved. I mean, you've you really uh, you've taken on so much. You you know, you really you don't need to kill her <laughs> is what he's saying, <laughs> you know, because, you know, what's you, you, you have so much now in your life um, more than you had before. Yeah. Yeah. You have, no, that's... You have wealth, but you have so much more. Yeah. So I think that's where he was coming from. But, uh, you know, I, I'm glad you remember that moment. It's a great. It's yeah. another great moment in the film. Yeah, for sure. Because and, and I think he was he was becoming so conscious about her finances, which are now his finances, because he had blown all of his money before. So he did have that's the ability right. to learn. <laughs> right. Right. From his uh, from his. He, if he had done it for himself, rather. Right. He would have. If he could have yeah. done that for he would never been in that situation in the first place. That's right. It, it, exactly exactly and uh the other really clever visual was when he goes and asks his uncle for for money uh she has the camera right up to uh james coco's face and his mouth is so wide open as he's laughing and that that math out head fits right into the mouth in the shot and of course what a great motif for the like this guy's just gonna eat him you know <laughs> it's like, like swallow him whole you know i mean right. that is a was a real i don't think i've ever seen a shot like that that was quite that was quite in that in the opening with that with the the camera pulling back and revealing that it was a mechanic and not a doctor those were really really great like just visually They're cinematic comic, great. comic yeah like you can make jokes just with your camera it's very just saying that and i like your t-shirt by the way can you just show everybody yeah, i got the elaine may here you see it's uh, uh i love That's these there, there's a lot of different female directors uh where you can that they have these directed by shirts so this i mean she's a favorite of mine so i definitely felt it was worth it <laughs> yes um Oh, I was just gonna say the the, the uh, new leaf uh w w did win some Golden Globe awards. Oh, got best I didn't motion know that. picture for comedy, best comedy, and also she got best comic actors. That oh year. wow! Yeah. It won best comedy picture. Wow! I didn't. I know. I know it did really well at the box office, and yeah. so did a Heartbreak Kid. And then you know, because she went 
way over budget. Um, and, you know, right. she's not the only director to do that. Um, and, you know, had a lot of problems with, uh, with the, in, in the post-production. And the same thing happened with Mikey and Nikki. And I think largely the fact that that didn't do well at the box office is why you didn't see another film from her for 12 years. Yeah. Uh, well, was it that long? I mean, uh, well, yeah, it was about nine years till like Warren Beatty approached her about bringing her yeah. on to Ishtar. And then, of course, that became, a, you know, an infamous, you know, difficult picture, um, which is unfortunate for her because she to think if she could have what she could have, you know, oh, done yeah. over the years. It's yeah. really, really it's 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 criminal, you know. Oh, no, uh, it really, you know, it really is. I mean, you know, Hollywood is just you know, you know, even, you know, but many, many, and it is not, it is not uncommon for things to go way over budget. I mean, David Lean did it a lot. I right. just read him the making of Ryan's daughter. I mean, that thing went way, way over budget. Michael and again, Chimino. Chimino. Yeah. We both read the biography and talked to Charles Elton. I mean, yeah, he, he was someone that, that of course, but he got punished too. So he got, yeah. Um, I mean, they certainly he went to director's um, jail. They call it director's jail. So <laughs> yeah, that's no, it's a shame. Did. It really is a shame. But even if you look at like Tootsie, which is such one of the great comedies as well. Uh, and she came up with a lot of the gags in that story. A lot of the script uh, was contributed from her and you could see it because she has that sort of, that embarrassing humor where it's so funny, but you you can't even look because it's embarrassing at the same time. Um, she's got, you know, you certainly have that feeling that you could, you could see it. One thing I thought of, cause I know Jerry Seinfeld said that Elaine May was a big inspiration. And when I watched this again, I really saw like George Costanza in the, the Henry character, it, particularly the fact that like, he's a, he's this con artist, Henry, he's always playing a part uh, um, in order to get something. So he's pretending to be something he's not. And, and you saw that in the heartbreak kid as well. And George Costanza in Seinfeld did that constantly. <laughs> uh, was there anything else you wanted to mention about this one? No, I oh, mean, my... you know, no, I think that's, that run, that's all my notes here. I mean, just to have people, you know, see it as soon as you can. Um, you know, it's just, it's one of the great comedy classics. Yeah absolutely yeah. everybody should see it yeah no i completely i completely agree i know you've been on the show a couple of times before but for for people just visiting uh my channel for the first time and meeting both of us can you uh you want to plug your social media outlets and your website well sure i mean the first thing people can do of course they can go to um whatever app they listen to podcasts on and they can subscribe and maybe leave a review i don't know if people still do that too much but uh and then youtube.com slash film wax radio there's a lot of stuff up there most of it makes the audio versions make the podcast but since most everything i do is over zoom and then like you know i just had karen allen and william sadler i said these two actors well the movie isn't going to be out it's in some festivals so you know in that case like i put it on the youtube channel because there's you know it's hard to see it but i still it's nice to, you know, not everybody can get to that festival, right. but once maybe it's easier to see, I'll put it on the podcast. So there is a lot of content that's on the YouTube channel. That's not on. That's all I'm trying to say. That's not on the audio podcast. Right. And then, right. you know, I'm it's slash film wax radio on most, most of the social media platforms. If you want to check out things and, and engage. Um, but yeah. Uh, and if you're a filmmaker or an actor and you've got some exciting project, you can always reach out, you know, Right. Um, to me um so yeah so that's it it was this is great it's nice to be back on yeah no thanks for coming on i'm 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 glad we uh did a comedy this time around i know we did a noir and a very serious <laughs> german post-world war ii film uh but uh no i really appreciated your insight because i think if i had done this on my own i don't think i would have seen uh more of the romantic hopeful things that you did <laughs> so uh, uh good eye certainly yeah <laughs> so okay, i'm gonna go great. now and have uh, well let's uh go go and enjoy our morgan david extra heavy malago wine with um <laughs> soda and lime juice yeah <laughs> you know classic <laughs> classic uh uh drink from the was that was that her drink or his that was her the drink she wanted right well he was drinking you know vintage french wine 
Um, and yeah, she was saying, you know, have you ever tried extra heavy? Yeah. You know, this Morgan David extra heavy Malago. I'm not sure what it all is, but it's, it's like, sounds grape. good. She says, it's like grape juice. And he goes, well, why don't you just yeah. drink grape just juice? Drink, drink, yeah. Cause it's yeah. not, a, it's not as sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and for listening. If you are currently listening to my YouTube video podcast on the audio version and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I have ever recorded can be found, youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I also want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the, to the Patreon link, patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. Patreon is bonus content that I create month in and month out, and it is based on polls that I put out at the beginning of every single month, which as a member, you will have access to vote on. So if you like my work and you're interested in supporting me over on Patreon, head over to the link for full details. And lastly, if this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo. It is absolutely free to do so. The logo is floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.